In today's video, we're going to talk about parallel link, also known as plink. In my opinion, this is the easiest, most elegant way to write code that runs in parallel in C Sharp. And once you're familiar with both link and plink, I'm sure you'll see many places in your application where you can take your sequential code, make it way more concise with link, and make it run way faster with plink. That said, there are many pitfalls and things that can look very funky if you're not familiar with how plink works under the hood. That's why in today's video, alongside covering every single thing that you can do with plink, so you're familiar with everything, we'll also talk about how plink is implemented behind the scenes so you have the background that you need to use plink correctly and confidently in your application. My name is Amichai, and in this channel, I talk about software architecture, design patterns, C -sharp .net, developer tools, things that you really must be familiar with if you're a software engineer. So if that sounds interesting, then make sure to smash the subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos. Okay, so these are all the methods that we're going to be covering in today's video. The entry point to using plink is the as parallel method. If you're not familiar with plink, then all it is is an implementation of link that runs in parallel, meaning that you can take each and every one of the extension methods that we talked about in the previous video that we talked about link, you can take each one of these methods and use them with plink, making it run in parallel or more correctly, making it run concurrently instead of running sequentially. So all these methods also work with plink. Now to go ahead and use plink, all you really need to do is put the as parallel method. So the way this looks is let's say we have some collection. So we have an enumerable dot range and the collection contains the elements zero until nine. And let's say that we have some projection where we take each one of the numbers and we do some heavy computation on it. So let's say over here, heavy computation, and let's pass it this I and whatever returns from this method is what we'll be projecting to. So let's say generate method, say this returns an int. And over here, let's say that our computation is we're simply going to iterate from zero until let's say 100 million. And each iteration, we're going to add I to n and finally we'll return n after we finish this entire thing so this is the projection that we're doing let's make this a bit more concise now of course if we simply go ahead and run the application then we're not really running anything yet because select uses deferred execution meaning that only when we try to consume the elements from the sequence or from the collection then the heavy computation will be triggered for each one of the numbers in the range zero until 10. So what we want to do is let's say over here that we this is some collection and to trigger the heavy computation, let's simply say for each, let's ignore whatever this is and let's say in collection and let's not do anything. This is only to create the enumerator and call move next, move next, move next until the end. So the heavy computation is being triggered. Also in the beginning, let's go ahead and create a stopwatch. So let's say stopwatch and this will be stopwatch dot start new. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure how long this takes simply as so. So let's say stop and let's print the number of milliseconds to the screen. So let's say milliseconds and let's dump this to the screen saying execution time. Now, real quick, before we continue, I want to remind you that I have three comprehensive courses on Dome Train. Two of them are a zero to hero in clean architecture, which comprise, in my opinion, the most comprehensive course for building production ready applications following clean architecture, including tests, authorization, everything you need to know when you're building production applications. And also another course on domain driven design, which also I don't think there's another comprehensive course like this course that teaches you everything you need to know to get started with domain driven design. So all the various terminology, various concepts, core concepts and principles that you need to know when you're working with domain driven design. So if you enjoy these videos, you want to expand your knowledge on clean architecture and domain driven design, and you want to see more of this on your screen, then make sure to check out the link in the description. Now back to the video. Okay, so if we go ahead and run the application now, then we expect this to take some time because again, we're doing some computation until 100 million. We're doing this 10 times, which is a billion operations. So let's see how long this is going to take. Okay, so we can see it took about two seconds to do the heavy computation. Now for actions like this, where we have a small collection and we have heavy computation for each one of the items in the sequence, then it makes sense to go ahead and use plink and take the action that we're doing sequentially and have it run concurrently. So to do this, all we need to do is use the as parallel method. So if we go ahead and simply add over here as parallel and we run the application again, we can see that the execution time went down by almost a factor of 10 to 259 milliseconds only. And that's because we're running it in parallel. So again, all we need to do in order to use parallel link 
is to add the as parallel extension method on an enumerable. And then all the various select methods, all the various link extension methods that you're familiar with are implemented also in plink and the implementation will use the concurrent implementation and then your code will run concurrently instead of sequentially. So if we look at this as parallel extension method, then we can see that it simply returns a parallel query where the select method is now running on a parallel query instead of running on the I enumerable. So when I go ahead and say that plink is an implementation of link, what I mean is that plink goes ahead and implements the same set of methods, the same API as link does. Okay, so that's the very first extension method, the entry point to using plink as parallel. Now, if you're familiar only with as parallel, then do yourself a favor and don't use plink in your applications because you need to be familiar with how things work under the hood so you don't make mistakes that are really easy to do when you're using plink. So let's talk about the rest of the methods and have a better understanding of how things actually work behind the scenes. So when we go ahead and call as parallel, we're telling plink go ahead and use how many degrees of parallelism that you think is correct to use or will maximize the speed of the query. Usually this will be something around the number of cores that you have on your machine. So since I have on my machine 12 cores, okay, so if I go ahead and say htop, then I can see over here that I have 12 cores, it'll likely try to utilize all 12 cores on my machine by creating 10 or 11 tasks in which each one of the tasks will run on a different core. So let's go ahead and demonstrate the behavior and then We'll take a step back and explain how things work under the hood. So let's go to the heavy computation method. And what we're going to do over here is we're simply going to dump to the screen what thread we're working on. So let's say over here, working on thread and let's put the current thread. So let's say environment dot current managed thread ID and let's dump this to the screen. So let's go ahead and run the application again. And we can see over here that we're running on various different threads each time. So one time on thread 13, one time on thread 14, one time on thread four, etc. If we look at the numbers, we can see that we're running here on 10 different threads. Hopefully we're utilizing 10 different cores in the same time, making the code run in parallel. But if we remove that as parallel and we go ahead and say .NET run. So as expected, we're running only on a single thread, running sequentially and doing the heavy computation one after the other. Now to make this a bit more readable, let's go ahead and create over here a threads map. And what this is going to be is it's going to be a concurrent dictionary and it's going to be from an int to a list of ints. And basically what I want to create is the following. I want to create a mapping between the thread ID and the list of numbers that are being computed by that thread. So for example, if on thread number one, we went ahead and computed numbers one, two, three, then this is how the entry will look like. If on thread number three, we computed numbers five, six, and seven, then we'll have the entry looking like so. So let's go ahead and initialize this threads map and then what we can do is the following. Over here, instead of printing to the screen, because we saw we had a race condition where it wasn't very readable. Instead, let's go ahead and say the following. Let's say threads map, and let's say add or update. And the key, like we said, is the thread ID. So let's go ahead and say environment dot current thread ID. And when we go ahead and add an item for the first time, so again, this is the key. This is the add value. So when we add a value for the first time, we want to create a list where we're adding only the current number. And when we're updating the list, then over here we have the key and the values. And we want to go ahead and alongside the existing values, we want to add the current number that we're processing now. So we have this adder update, which goes ahead and updates the threads map. We're doing some heavy computation. We're returning the number. And lastly, let's go over here and say that we also want to print the threads map. So I say threads map dot dump. Okay, so now looking at the output, then we can see that on thread number four, we processed number two. On thread number six, we processed number zero. On thread number seven, we processed number one, et cetera, et cetera, where over here we can see the execution time. Now, ideally, you don't want to run code that goes ahead and accesses a shared resource from all the various threads because this requires some synchronization, but this is just for demonstration purposes so I can show you the usage of with degree of parallelism. So now let's go ahead and say with degree of parallelism. So instead of it being the default, let's go ahead and say over here something like two. So now if we go ahead and run the application again, we can see that we have only two threads. Thread number six processed numbers zero, one, two, three, and four, and thread number seven processed the numbers five to nine. 
So now let's talk about the interesting part. How is this actually implemented by plink? So what we have is the following. We have our source collection. So let's go ahead and call this the source. And over here, we have the numbers zero until nine. Then because we asked for a maximum degree of parallelism of two, again, we're asking for the maximum, not exactly two. So because we're asking for the maximum of two, then what we have over here are, let's call it for now, just two tasks, okay? Now in our specific implementation, because we know the number of elements in the source sequence, then we know how to go ahead and partition the source collection and divide the workload between these two tasks. So what Peeling does is it goes ahead and says, okay, what's the count? It's 10, for example. Great, let's go ahead and take the first five elements, give it to this task. Let's take the next five elements and give it to this task. Now, these two tasks are created using the TPL, meaning that these two tasks are going to be queued and executed by the managed thread pool. Each one of these tasks is responsible for running the computation on a subset of the items in the source collection. Like we said, because we know in advance the number of items in our collection, then we can go ahead and say, okay, this will run the numbers one, two, three, four. Let's imagine that I had enough room. And this will go ahead and execute the numbers five to nine. As you can imagine, this step over here isn't triggered automatically when we go ahead and call select, but we need someone to iterate over the collection. So let's imagine that over here in the other side, we have the consumer. So let's say over here, consumer. The consumer in our case is the for each loop in which we're iterating over the collection. So what happens is the consumer goes ahead and tries to get the first item, right? So we're calling move next. Then we're trying to access the current item. And what we basically want to receive is this zero, but we don't get it yet. So what happens is that when we go ahead and we call move next for the first time in our specific example, so this won't always be the case, we're triggering both of these tasks where both of these tasks, each one of them gets a start index and an end index. Then let's say thread number six, the one that picked up this task, finished working on the first item. So it finished the computation for number zero and it went ahead and it added the numbers from one until whatever it was, 100 million. Then it doesn't take this new number and simply give it to the consumer, but instead it passes it to an output buffer. So over here, there's another step where we have the output buffer, where once the computation is finished for that specific value, then it's put into the output buffer. So let's imagine that this turns into the number one, two, three. So when zero is done computing, then the number is put in the output buffer. Then if the next item that finished computation is, let's say this item, then whatever the number that this computed into will be the next item in the output buffer. That's why the order isn't preserved in the final consumer. So when the items in the output buffer are made available to the consumer, then the consumer goes ahead and receives the first item. And if it's this number and then this number and then this number, etc., then the order will be zero, five, one, etc. And the order of the final items in the final sequence won't be the order in the original collection. Okay, so this is just a few words about how it works behind the scenes, but we'll see that this isn't always the case. This is true only for collections that we know what the number of items are. So this is some array, some I list, some collection in which we know the index and we can go ahead and divide the index between the various threads. But as we'll see in a few minutes, this isn't always the case. Okay, so this is with degree of parallelism, what we talked about, I put the example over here. So for my patrons, you'll have the corresponding example next to the with degree of parallelism. Before we go ahead and show the next interesting things, which are these over here, there are a few easy methods I want to get out of the way because it should be pretty easy to explain now that we know some of the theory. So the first thing I want to show is that over here, we ignored the item in the collection, but if we didn't ignore it, so let's say we have over here some N and we go ahead and say N dot dump and let's dump this to the screen. Then we expect the order not to be the same order, right? Cause we said whatever the order is in the output buffer, that will be the order in the output as well. So as expected, again, we have two threads, six and seven, where each one of them got a specific subset of the sequence. And over here, because I'm stupid and I forgot that the number isn't going to be very obvious. So let's, instead of this, let's simply say we want to return the original N. So let's say we have over here, original N, and this will be N. And finally, let's return original N. So now running this again, then as expected, we can see that the order isn't the order, 
that the sequence originally was. So we can see over here that we have five and zero, which makes sense knowing that we have only two threads. Then we have six and one, where again, we have the next item of this one and the next item of this one. So again, it makes sense corresponding to the underlying implementation and so on until the end where we have four and nine. If we want the output sequence to be in the same order, then we can go ahead and use the as ordered extension method. So if we say we're here as ordered. So this time we get the numbers in the original order. If earlier upstream, someone defined the order to be ordered, but we want it to be unordered, then instead of as ordered, we can go ahead and call it as unordered, which will make sure that the order doesn't necessarily match the order of the original sequence. And over here, we can see that since we called as ordered, but then we called as unordered, then the output sequence isn't in the same order. Okay, real quick, let's talk about these four methods. So these three are pretty easy. So instead of calling enumerable.range and then as parallel, we can go ahead and use parallel enumerable.range and remove the as parallel. And this will go ahead and return a parallel query instead of us having to take the I enumerable and turn it into a parallel query. So if we go ahead and run this now, then we expect it to run exactly the same thing like before. So we see we have the numbers zero to four, five to nine, running again, thread six and seven, and the order is unordered because we still have the as ordered and then as unordered. Similar to range, we have also repeat. So if we go ahead and call it repeat, then this will repeat the number zero 10 times. And I already ran it in the background. So we can see we have now the 10 numbers and over here we have the numbers zero 10 times. We also have it empty. So if we go ahead and call this empty and let's say empty of int, then this won't output anything because there aren't any items in the sequence. So if we go ahead and run this, then as expected, this took less time and we don't have anything in the output because the sequence was empty. So nothing over here was executed. Okay, next we have as sequential. So as sequential is the opposite of as parallel. So if we go ahead and call this as sequential, then first of all, we can't call this anymore. And also if we now look at the output and we change this from being empty to let's say range of let's say again, zero to 10. Then we can see that again, we're using only one thread. We have all the numbers and the order of course will be the same because we're not running in parallel, but also the execution time is again, back to what it was before. Now, because as sequential is the opposite of as parallel, we can go ahead and do the following. And this is actually very powerful. So we can go ahead and say enumerable dot range zero to 10. This will create a regular enumerable. Then if we know we have some heavy computation that we need to do, then we can go ahead and call as parallel do the heavy computation in parallel. So this is heavy. We want this to run yes in parallel. But then we know that we have some actions over here where we're creating a lot of objects on the heap or we're invalidating the same cache line or perhaps we're accessing the same shared resource from many threads. We know that this action won't run fast in parallel or it's just a waste of resources or perhaps it just runs slower than it runs sequentially, then we can go ahead and call as sequential and then have this run sequential. So I'm sure you can see how powerful this is where if in your link query you have, let's say a long link query and somewhere in the middle, you need something to run in parallel, then all we need to do is put this small block of as parallel and then as sequential. And this part over here, we'll go ahead and create as many tasks as the cores or whatever you specify in the with degree of parallelism and it'll run in a concurrent fashion and afterwards it'll be merged together into a single sequence and the next operations will happen sequentially. So if you're already using link extensively in your application, then utilizing plink and making parts of the query run in parallel is extremely easy. Okay, now let's talk about with cancellation. So let's say this is still what we have, but we also have some cancellation token and we want to stop the heavy computation once the cancellation token is canceled. So let's imagine that we have over here some CTS, which is a new cancellation token source. So we have our cancellation token. We can go ahead and pass it calling with cancellation and we can pass over here the token like so. Then once we go ahead and we call cancel, then it'll stop the workload, whatever's going on and it'll throw an exception. So let's go ahead and say .NET to run. And since we cancel the token before it finished processing the entire sequence, then it threw an exception. Okay, next we have with merge options. So this is very interesting. So let's talk about this. Let's just revert to a simple example again. Okay, so like we said, what we have behind the scenes is the following. We have the source collection. Then over here, we have all the various tasks which go ahead and 
compute or run the computation on a subset of the original source sequence. Finally, we have over here the consumer, which is trying to consume the items from the sequence. And this is again what triggers the entire process. Now, like we said, the items don't go straight to the consumer once they're done being processed, but instead we have over here the output buffer. Now this with merge options talks about how are the items made available to the consumer from the output buffer. Meaning that over here, let's say we have, let's say the same thing like before. So we have over here two tasks and over here again, we have the numbers zero until nine. So by default, the merge item is auto, meaning that we don't decide how many items will be in the output buffer before it's made available to the consumer. So it's not like, let's say we have the zero. So zero went to this task and went to the output buffer and then it's immediately available to the consumer, but instead it accumulates some items in the output buffer and only then it's made available to the consumer. So the options are either auto, and then we have some block determined by P-Link, whatever things is correct to use. Another option is fully buffered. So we wait until the output buffer is completely full, meaning that all the items in the source sequence finished computing, they're all filled over here in the output buffer. And only then the consumer can go ahead and start consuming these items. And the last option is not buffered, where it's sort of like streaming, right? So the lines that we have over here is what will happen. So we can skip this part over here where once an item finished being processed by the tasks, then it's made available to the consumer. Now you may be asking yourself, what happens if, for example, the first item really was zero, great. So zero is over here, it's available for the consumer. But the next item that is ready is let's say item number five. So it was computed on this thread and then it was the next item that's ready. And we can't return five because we specified as ordered. So because we specified as ordered, then the next item that should return is not five, but it's one. So what happens in this case is, and I'm not sure if this is the exact implementation, but this is the behavior at least. So five will be stored. Let's imagine over here in the output buffer and whatever other items that are ready will be waiting in the output buffer but only when one is available, then one will be returned to the consumer. If we, let's say, return four now, five is already ready from beforehand, so five will return right away, etc. Okay, so the order is still maintained, but it's stored in some intermediate buffer. So let's go ahead and see this in action, and I wanna demonstrate this a bit differently. So instead of this being enumerable.range, let's call this my range and let's pass it zero to 10. So over here we have static my range, which receives a start and a count. And this will be a simple for loop where we have i running from start until start plus count. And every time we increment i, and over here we say yield return i like so. Now the reason I have this is because when plink goes ahead and receives an enumerable, it takes a look and checks, is it an I list? Is it an array? Is it an, a collection type that is indexable? And we can go ahead and partition it in a specific way. Because this over here is our implementation and currently returns 10 items, they could also run here indefinitely. plink doesn't know how many items exist and the partitioning is a bit different and I want us to see that as well. So we have the my range method, this returns yield returns the numbers zero to nine. We're running this in parallel and we're doing the heavy computation. In this heavy computation method, alongside whatever we're doing over here, let's also go ahead and say in the beginning, let's say processing and the number that we're currently processing, like so, let's dump this to the screen. And up here where we're consuming and let's also go over here and say consuming and display the number that we're currently consuming. Okay, just to simplify some things, let's get rid of all of these outputs to the screen. So again, all we're doing is we're taking this 10 items, we're calling as parallel, we're running the heavy computation, which will output to the screen, which number is being processed every time it's being processed. And over here, we have the consumption. Now, if we didn't have as parallel, then what we expect to have is processing zero, consuming zero, processing one, consuming one, because the consumption of items in the sequence is what drives yield returning the next values. So if we go ahead and simply run this, then as expected, we have processing zero, consuming zero, processing one, consuming one, et cetera, et cetera, until the end. But if we go ahead and add as parallel and we go ahead and run this again, 
Then we can see, first of all, there's a race condition, of course, when we are printing to the screen, which is okay. But we can see that we're processing all the items and then afterwards we're consuming all the items. So we can see that the buffering used by default was enough to store all the various items. So all these were computed and only when all of these were computed, then it was made available to the consumer and we went ahead and we consumed all the values. If we wanted to go ahead and consume each one of the items as soon as it's computed, then we can go ahead and say with merge options and we can specify not buffered, meaning that it will be available to the consumer right away. And to demonstrate this, let's go ahead and change this to be with a degree of parallelism of two. So it's easier to see the output. So we see over here, we have a mixture of processing and consumption because as soon as the item finished processing, then it's available for the consumer. Now the documentation is pretty good. So if you forget this, then you can see use a merge without output buffers. As soon as result elements have been computed, make that element available to the consumer of the query. Okay, so pretty straightforward. If we go ahead and use default, then it uses the default merge type, which is auto buffered. Like we said, this uses a merge with output buffers of a size chosen by the system. So it's not determined. Results will accumulate into an output buffer before they are available to the consumer of the query. Finally, we have fully buffered, which will wait until all the items are accumulated before they're made available to the consumer. So if we go ahead and say over here, fully buffered, and we run this again, then we can see that the various items have been processed and over here they're being consumed one after the other. Okay, so that was with merge options. Next we have with execution mode and finally we have for all. Now, before we talk about that, I wanna show you something that's important to be familiar with when you're working with plink. So let's clear some things up over here. So what we have now is the following. My range will return the items zero, then it'll yield return one, yield return two, et cetera, et cetera, until nine, including. Then we're creating two tasks, which will go ahead and process a subset of the original sequence. Over here, we're doing some heavy computation. So each one of these two tasks will go ahead and process the items that it consumed. And we're not printing anything to the screen anymore. The only thing that we're printing is which thread processed which numbers. So if we go ahead and run this, then I want you to notice the following interesting thing. So we have, as we're familiar already, two threads, six and seven took a subset of the original sequence. But what is interesting is that you can see the numbers because it's not an indexable collection. So we can't go ahead and say, we know we have in advance 10 items. So this task will take this subset and this task will take this subset. Instead, we have the numbers being distributed in a different way between the two tasks. So this distribution of the numbers or the sequence is called the partitioning of the original sequence. So we have over here the original sequence and over here we have the various tasks. In our case, we have two tasks, like we said. What happens is that instead of each one of these getting a start index and an end index, and it knows how to operate between these two indexes, instead what happens is that a chunk from the sequence is given to the first thread and another chunk is given to the next thread. It processes whatever they had in this chunk. Then once it finishes, it goes back and it asks for the next chunk and it'll get a next chunk. And then when this thread finishes, it'll also go back and get the next chunk. And you can imagine it like a queue where each time whatever task is available, requests another chunk, gets that chunk and processes it. Now, the size of the chunk, as you can see over here in the beginning, is one. So this has zero, this has one, then this finished processing, so it asked for another one, it got two, then this one finished and it got three, et cetera, et cetera. But as the collection is bigger, then the chunks become also bigger and bigger. So because the synchronization required to distribute the chunks to the different tasks is expensive, then the chunks become bigger and bigger as the collection grows or as Peeling sees that the collection is pretty big. So if we have, let's say a hundred numbers, then we can see that still we have two threads. In the beginning, the chunks were of a size one, but as we go on, then we can see that the chunks start becoming of size two. And as we go on, then they become bigger and bigger. So over here, the chunk is of size four. And as we said, the chunks grow as the collection size is greater to reduce the synchronization between the two threads. On the other hand, if this was simply enumerable dot range, so we say enumerable, that range and we run this again then we can see that the numbers are distributed in an expected manner and we have one of them getting the first 50 and the second one getting the next 50. okay now let's talk about with execution mode so this is pretty simple so if you go ahead and say with execution mode 
Then you can see that we have two execution modes. The first one is default, which is what will be used if you don't specify anything. And the second one is force parallelism. So I kind of lied in the beginning. So this over here doesn't necessarily mean that the code will run in parallel. Instead, it's like hinting to plink or requesting from plink, try to run the code as fast as possible. If it thinks and it recognizes that running sequentially will be faster than running concurrently, then it'll go ahead and execute the code sequentially. Now the algorithm behind the scenes for this, if I'm not mistaken, is looking at what operators are being used. So there are some operators that are known to be more expensive or the potential of them being expensive running sequentially is higher. So for example, if we go ahead and call select, select will likely run yes in parallel. But if we go ahead and call select, which also uses the index, so we get over here i and the current index, and we call it like this instead, then this over here is more likely to run sequentially and not in parallel. So it sort of looks at the shape of the link query. It decides whether it thinks it'll run faster sequentially or concurrently, and it decides to run it that way. If you notice that plink got it wrong and it ran it sequentially when it could have run it faster concurrently, so you run some benchmarks, whatever, then you can go ahead and say with execution mode and you can force it to run in parallel. Okay, last but definitely not least, we have for all. So when we go ahead and we iterate over the collection over here, then what we're doing is we merge together the result of all the different tasks and only then we can go ahead and do something over here. If we need to do something on each one of the results from the tasks, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen after the items are being merged. So for example, you're calling some API, which is independent from the other API calls, whatever it is, if you don't need to merge the collection in the end, then you can go ahead and call for all. What for all does is it'll execute the delegate that you specify on the thread that the task is being executed on. So over here, we're running again on the main thread because we merged all the results, but whatever we have in the for all will execute on the source thread. So if we say over here for all, and we take whatever number we have and we dump to the screen, let's say processing i on environment dot current managed thread ID. So this now replaces the for each and this thing over here won't run on the main thread, but it will run on the currently executing thread. So if we go ahead and say .NET run now, and let's change this from being 100 to 10. And if we look over here, then we expect to see that number five was on one, number one was on four. So we can see that we have number one on four, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. So instead of running on the main thread, then you can do this action on the thread that picked up the task as well. And you can leverage different cores to do it in the same time in parallel, which also means that if you just want to write some code in parallel, all you need to do is you can go ahead and say parallel innumerable, and you can call it range. You can say zero to let's say 10, and then you can say for all. And over here, you have 10 tasks, hopefully running on 10 different threads, or you can say with degree of parallelism, whatever you want. And you have over here code that will run in parallel. Now this is the end of your link query. So after this, you don't have a collection that you can work with, which means that you can only use this where you don't need to merge the sequence into a single collection that you can later use. Finally, I want to solve the riddle that I posted earlier this week. So let's say we have over here some collection and this collection is innumerable.range zero to three. And for each one of these, we go ahead and we print the number to the screen. So I say we have over here the method print, which returns the number and not before it says dump and to the screen. And then over here, we're saying for each and we're simply iterating over the collection. But in the first iteration, then we're exiting the program like so. So again, this is the program that we have. If we go ahead and we run it currently without running in parallel. So of course, we're simply running sequentially. So what we expect is that this over here is the consumer. It's driving to yield the next result, which is zero. So we'll get zero and then we'll exit the program. And as we can see, we get zero and we exited the program with the status code zero. But if we go ahead and change this to as parallel, then the question is what is going to be the output now? So I want you to take a moment and think about that. What do you think based on the knowledge that you have now will be the output? So let's go ahead and run this and see what the output will be. So we can see that we have zero to one. 
as expected. I hope it's expected by this point. So like we said, we have over here the collection, we have the output buffer over here, and we have the consumer. By default, we're using auto buffered, meaning the system chooses the buffer size for the output. So because we didn't specify the degree of parallelism, and in my computer, I have more than one core, then this over here will run in parallel, meaning that we'll have multiple tasks running in parallel. Each of them will receive a different subset of the original numbers. And I also didn't specify the merge options, meaning that there's an output buffer being used where the size of the output buffer is chosen by the system. As we already saw beforehand, for a simple query, even when we went up until 10, the output buffer that was used was bigger than 10, meaning that all of these three numbers will have to accumulate in the output buffer before they're made available for the consumer. Meaning that this over here will run three times, it will finish executing three times, printing the number in some order to the screen, and only then will exit the program, okay? So the answer is for a single core machine, we expect to see, actually we can also demonstrate over here, we can go ahead and say with degree of parallelism, one, so that the maximum is one. So we expect it now to run sequentially. And if it runs sequentially, then we expect the output to be zero and then exiting the program. Great, and that's indeed what we get. So again, on single core machines, the output will be zero. And on multi-core machines, the output is going to be the three numbers in a random order. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Make sure to smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.